that all the force of will you will ever need is found in the art of letting go. All the force you need is no force at all. And as part of the surrender and the letting go is to literally live by the whimsy of the divine. Just know that you will go where you're supposed to go and you will be where you're supposed to be and do what you're supposed to do if you can live your life with that much surrender. And this is where the truth lies. Not in the right or in the wrong, but in the in-between. I'm really excited to be here with Jim Bruton, and he's going to share about his near-death experience, which is different in some ways from the typical near-death experience. Hi, Melissa. How are you today? I'm great. I'm excited to be here with you, and I would love to start out by hearing your near-death experience and everything that led up to that. Sounds great. and It's great to be here with you and those who join you on your podcast. Thank you. So as you mentioned, uh, growing up, I really couldn't make up my mind what I wanted to do for a living. And I guess the question may still be open, but I, it was in the realization of the dream of old airplanes that, that brought me to the door of my near-death experience. It was the second experimental aircraft I'd built. It was a historical reproduction of a little French airplane from 1933, really tiny, very whimsical looking. And I lost the engine on my second test flight. And because of the early aviation design, yeah, you know, when you cut power, they come down quickly. It didn't glide really well like today's aircraft. So I couldn't make it back to my airstrip. So I just kind of had to, in the forested, hilly, rocky area I was, I had to look for, you know, what I could to, to bring it down in terms of an emergency landing. And there was a, a Boy Scout camp nearby with a small lake. So I said, well, I'll just aim for that. And what happened is I overshot the bank and I crashed into all these tree trunks uh, in the equivalent of like a soapbox derby car with a big propeller and engine right in front of my face. I don't know how I didn't eat it, but crashing into all these trees at about 70 miles an hour in a little wooden box, it just instantly exploded into matchsticks. The only part of the airplane still intact was that which was behind me, to which I was still seat belted. Um, luckily, even though this was in October, it was October 6, 2016, so it's just over six years ago. At that time of year, the Boy Scout camp was closed, but fortunately for me, there was a man fishing nearby. His name was Greg Gubatosi, a retired police officer as well as teacher. Thank heavens he was a police officer because, you know, he's probably used to seeing trauma like a car crash or something like that. And so he was fishing, enjoying the peace and quiet of the camp because it was closed until I literally came crashing down. Uh, but he uh, ran over, you know, tried to assess the situation and called 911. Again, luckily he had a cell phone on him. I had broken all my ribs and ruptured both lungs. My right leg looked like a pretzel. I had a hole in my lower back from the battery breaking loose and hitting me as a 70-mile-an-hour projectile. My chin was pretty torn up as well. So anyway, maybe 45 minutes later, uh, the medical helicopter came in, and you know, it wasn't too hard to pull me out of the wreckage because, like I said, so much of it was matchsticks on the ground. But they put me in the helicopter and flew me up to Hartford, Connecticut's trauma center, uh, where there was a waiting team. And they took me right in. And a few hours later, when my family and friends started to arrive, I was in a breathing machine. I was intubated with a big tube down my throat and had all kinds of other tubes coming in and going out of me. I'd already escaped from my restraints once, and they had to re-restrain me. And the suggestion was made that with a week's worth of day-long operations coming up, some with only a 2% chance of success, that it would be best to put me into a medically induced coma. So everyone said, sure, no problem. Whatever makes it easy, easiest for everyone. So again, you know, without being able to certainly say, because first of all, I was been delirious. And second of all, you know, on pain medication and everything else, there was no way to really be certain of this. But my estimation is that when they put me into a coma here, that's when my near-death experience started. And what's kind of interesting is 
later on, when I was looking at my computer recuperating the hospital, I said, I wonder what the last email is I remember seeing or sending. And I scrolled back through and it literally was two days before my crash. So I had that much of my memory just knocked out of me. And so with that little period of amnesia on the front end of the near-death experience, when I came out of the coma about a week later, I would say for another week, my mind really still wasn't functioning. So it's almost like having two bookends of amnesia with this incredibly lucid experience tucked in between. How does that happen? I can't imagine. But as I went into a coma here and my near-death experience started, in contrast to so many near-death experiences where you hear about people going through a tunnel and seeing dead loved ones, maybe they're in a beautiful heavenly landscape, sometimes not. It, you know, they might be in the stars, they might be in a void, but basically they're, they're in a usually fairly non-threatening environment. Sometimes it's beautiful. They may see angelic beings and then they have a life review. They might get some big message and they come back. For me, mm, no. However, I did have an experience that may be a somewhat variation on the life review theme. And we'll talk about that in a moment. For me, it's as if I just had teleported, bam, into this post-apocalyptic landscape. Uh, like imagine wh whatever largest city you've ever been in hundreds or a thousand years after a nuclear bomb went off or a meteor hit or something like that, just a totally, totally dead cityscape. And you're looking out across it and its ruins and it's just all gray. And above me were all these huge, dark and heavy clouds, like the mother of all storms was getting ready to unload. So there was just this waiting for something big to happen kind of feeling in the air, if you will. And as I looked around, I saw this large egg-shaped sculpture. You can see it on the wall behind me. There's a depiction I created of it. And it was like made of open lattice work. And you could see through it. And I um, had, well, I was looking around, all of a sudden I got hit by this wave of nausea, like this incredible pain in my abdomen. And I remember saying something like, I don't think I can stand this. And when I said that, I heard all these little whirrings of like gears uh, inside that egg shaped sculpture. And as I looked, I could see little tiny motions within. So I made my way over to it. And as I looked through the open lattice work, I could see sus just fairly suspended in the air, lots and lots and lots of little gears. But these were a special kind of gear called a sector gear. When you think of a gear, you normally think of a wheel with little teeth all the way around it, like you might see in a clock or something. A sector gear is like a, a pie slice of that, if you will. And it's, it's a piece of the gear, and it's meant to rotate back and forth, meaning it has a beginning, a middle, and an end to its movement, in contrast to a round gear that just goes around and around. And as I looked at the gear, some were very clear and definite, and some were more ghost-like and would just they could just pass through each other. It's like they were just kind of idling, in, like fi fish swimming in a tank, if you will. and when I um, looked at them, though, whatever one I looked at, it's like a video feed would play in my head. And obviously, that video feed was what that gear represented. And in these visions, if you will, th these video feeds, I could see myself as an older person, or I could see my children grown with their own children. So I realized, oh, these are all events for my future. And at one point, I you was looking and I just sort of said out loud or thought out loud, you know, what is this thing? And this disembodied voice came and was with me the entire time. They said, this is the future birthing into the now. This is the process of becoming. And I thought, okay, well, like I said, since some of the gears looked very concrete and definite and some were not, I, I put my hand through the lattice work to see if I could touch them. What would they feel like? And as I did, one brushed by my hand, and again, I doubled over in pain. But with a reflex, I, I grabbed it, pulled it through the lattice work out and, and threw it away. And all of a sudden, all the gears started spinning around like a, a hive of angry hornets or something until they settled down. I said, what's happening now? And the voice said, each gear is the probability of a thought, word, 
or action in your future. Your destiny is resetting itself around what you've removed. And I think it's significant because when we say those gears represented a thought, word, or action, that's why they were designed to move in such a way that has a beginning, middle, and an end. And that's why it was that particular type of gear. I've, I've never seen one of these gears in my life. Found out since then they're in motorcycle transmissions. They might be in different clock-like mechanisms, but I had never, you know, for all the gears I've seen in my life, they're always just the round kind. Anyway, I, I said, well, how did I know I could do that? Pull that gear out and remove that future moment. And the voice literally asked, why else are you here? And I said, I have no idea. I don't even know what this place is. Remember, it's not like I at any point was saying, I'm about to die or I'm about to have a near-death experience. You know, I, I crashed. I'm like, in you know, la-la land. And, and next thing I know, I'm in a coma. And it said, you're in the in-between. And I said, in-between what? And it said, everything. The impossible now between the past and the future. And I said, that makes no sense whatsoever. And it said, it's impossible in its short duration. But here you are, standing inside the eternity of a single moment. I said, do you remember the world to which your body belongs? And I remember concentrating really hard. And I remember thinking, at least later, that if someone had come up and said, if you stay here any longer, you can't go back, I'd say, go back where? to earth or whatever and say, earth what? And if they'd say, well, to your family, I'd say, what family? And so I said, I have no idea. And the voice then said, then you see the truth and how the past is dust. I said, okay. I said, well, why do some of these gears, these futures that I touch cause pain and some not? And it said, all choices have unintended consequences, some unfortunate and some not. The pain each brings is your guide. And I said, where are the gears that feel good? And he said, you're not here to feel good. And then I saw a new gear swinging into view. And on this one, I saw happy grandchildren that I have yet to have. You know, they're on a ride at an amusement park. And they were smiling and laughing, you know, as if they were looking at me, but obviously threw me into their own world. And I, of course, let that gear pass by. I wouldn't want to remove that one. And so I just kept looking at the movement of the gears and, and really paying attention to how some seem very definite and some not. And I, I think my analysis, my post-game analysis was that the ones that were very definite were probably the ones that have more certainty to come about, or they're maybe closer in time. Whereas the ones that were more ephemeral were either further out in time or perhaps less likely to come about, possibility. Anyway, each time they came to rest, I sort of used pain to search around until I touched one that hurt, and then I would remove it, and then the whole thing would recycle. And, you know, at some point I felt bad that I, was, I didn't have a better moral compass to make these choices, because what I was removing were choices that would be to my spiritual detriment. And the pain I was feeling was the pain that choice would cause, if not me, someone else. And so this is why I say in a way it's kind of like a life review, but one with actionable intelligence. You know, you can actually do something about it. You can actually, whereas many near-death experiences are very passive, this one required my interaction. This required me doing something, making a choice. And the choice was to remove as many bad choices in my future as I was given time and opportunity to do. And that way, kind of stack the deck, if you will, going forward, leaving myself more good choices or even neutral choices than bad ones. So anyway, I just kept going through this over and over. And at one point, I looked at this pile of growing pile of gears behind me, and I said, it's starting to look like a, if I don't have a bad future, I have no future at all. I said, even though I feel less pain because it's like I'm, I'm loosening up that load. Am I going to die sooner from doing all this? And the voice said, your destiny has to fit itself around futures that aren't meant to be. Your number of breaths are already counted. I will worry about your last one. I said, I don't know how comforting that is. And they said, well, eliminating bad choices doesn't mean you won't make wrong ones. It's not necessarily a sin to make a mistake, right? He said, you won't know they are wrong 
until after they pass. And since right and wrong are variables over which you have no control, the answers to what come tomorrow are a waste. It's better to simply understand the beauty of how everything fits and refits together. Basically, have faith in the grand design. You know, that I know what I'm doing. I was like, okay. And I said, what am I missing here in my lack of understanding? Because it was obvious this thing was a lot bigger than me. It said, what is clearly before you? Grace. No one deserves salvation. It can only be given by grace. It is your birthright, but it has to be chosen at the expense of the world that separates us. And I said, well, this fixing my future is painful. And like I said, I, I kind of feel ashamed. I don't have any better moral compass than pain. I don't even know where or when these futures happen. And it said, when or where are not important. But removing your enthusiasm to further chain yourself to the world isn't as painful as carrying the crushing weight of those chains once they're forged around you. I said, it's as if this place was designed, you know, kind of like a, a maze for a mouse. I said, it's designed like there, there's only one thing I can do and no chance to mess it up. And it said, if those with choices make poor use of them, then offering fewer possibilities could be called mercy. You can't change the past, but you can make better choices in the future. Everything is interconnected and pay more attention to your relationships. Be gentle with everyone, as I'm gentle with you. And I remember thinking about all this pain I'd experienced. I said, what's gentle about all this? He said, you prayed for something for which being here is the answer. And now the man who fell from the sky is not the same who flew into it. And those were its parting words. And I took one last look at the pile, at the sky, at the city, and at the egg. And I said, I think I can live with this now. And with that, um, it just, it's like, it just faded from view and I was gone. Yeah, it was, it was definitely more than me. That's for sure. And I am so, so grateful to, to have had it. And, you know, late afterwards, you know, as, as I, like I said, when I came out of the coma, it was still another week before I had a functioning mind is all the, I guess, drugs had to wear off and stuff. And I really came to not in the main hospital, but in the rehabilitation hospital. And I would say my first memory literally was this memory of this event. And it was just like, as if it were um, just cycling over and over in my head. And with each iteration, there was more depth, more detail, more of an emotional impact. And I was like, what in the world is this? You know, it's just as somebody had stuck a cassette in my head with a pre-video thing. It, it, it was really strange. And I. I I I did know about out of body experiences. I'd heard of near death experiences, but I don't think I was as conversant on, you know, what their hallmarks milestones were. So I was pretty sure I, this must have been an out of body experience I had. And so, um, I I remember. It's interesting. Later on, I read the story. Remember the story about grace, and or the mention about grace, and it was that this. Uh, Man was, you know, looking for a, a guru, someone to show him the truth. And he went before him and he said, is it true that our destiny is written in our palms? And the guru said, yeah. And he said, well, so why do I need you? He said, well, just because you know it's going to happen because it's written in your palm doesn't mean you can change it, doesn't mean you can avoid it. He said, if you want to live by the destiny that's written in your palm, it can. Or you can make the choice to live within the grace of God. And that is not tracked by any star. It's not written in any palm. And so I think that was part of the big lesson I was taking away from this. That it, again, no one deserves salvation or whatever. You know, what do we really deserve in life if you think about it? But to live within that grace, you may not have any, any idea what's going to happen next, but that's part of the fun. That's part of the journey. That's part of the surrender and the letting go is to literally live by the whimsy of the divine. Just know that you will go where you're supposed to go. and You will be where you're supposed to be and do what you're supposed to do if you can live your life with that much surrender. And 
it's kind of interesting because in the Bible, where it says, be still and know that I am God, the more accurate translation is let go and know that I am God. And I think, you know, my, my first big lesson, and, and I, like you said, I've written two books. The first one, you know, I, I went to the International Association of Near-Death Studies um, annual conference in 2019, which was the last one before COVID hit. And I presented my experience and some dear friends really pressured me and said, you've got to go write the book. So I came home and I wrote the book in about three months. And it's called The In-Between, A Trip of a Lifetime. And then, like I said, there, there weren't in-person conferences for two years after that. This past year, 2022, was the next one. And I was there for that as well. What happened was a year later, I wrote a second book called, because, you know, through some podcasts and interviews and more interaction with people, they were saying, how do we put any of this into practice? So I did my best to see what I could do to articulate that in, into a book called The Practice in Between the Art of Letting Go. And the reason I wanted to have that title was to sort of pay homage to my recuperation time in the hospital. Uh, I grew up not drinking around, I don't know, the age of 42. You know, if I had a high-stress job, I'd come home and make a rum and Coke. And if it was nice, I might have two more. And I wouldn't say I was an alcoholic, though. It didn't, wouldn't matter if I was. I mean, it's not really part and parcel of the story. But I, my wife at the time would get a little concerned about it. And while I was laying there in the hospital, the boys came, and I guess we were having a conversation or something, and it removed from me the representation of alcohol. It was sort of suspended in the air in front of me. And literally it said, what do you want to do with this? Do you want to carry it with you, meaning into your future, or do you want to leave it behind? It said, if you want to, carry, if you want to take it with you, I will carry it for you. If you want to leave it behind, I will remove all attachment to it. I have no pull on you. It'd be as if you never had a drink in your life. I said, leave it behind. And so it literally just... Like like vapor just disappeared. And I don't drink. I haven't had a drink in those six years. I'm not inclined to. It's just not part of who I am. And it literally said to me, because you know, I know what a mountain of will it takes for some people who struggle with that. So I don't want to play that down at all. I know it's truly a moment-by-moment -moment decision. But for me, the voice of the in-between was saying, that all the force of will you will ever need is found in the art of letting go. Always live life in celebration of the individual spirit. For no one and no thing can stand before the brilliance of a truly naked soul. And that's why I, like I said, I wanted to incorporate that into the title of the second book. Oh, that's beautiful, Jim. So I wanted to come back to that statement you made that the only force of will you'll ever need is the art of letting go. It seems like two opposing things, the force of will and the art of letting go. Yeah, it's as if sometimes it's like he's making a little bit of a joke, like saying you're standing in the impossible now. What's the impossible now? You know, it's impossible because it's impossibly short, but impossibly wide. It's across universes, right? Um, but... That's as much, I think, because it, it was speaking to me in a way that I would appreciate and I would understand and even nuance some humor into it. But yeah, it, but basically it's also saying all the force you need is no force at all, right? All the effort you need to make is no effort at all. Wow, that makes sense. Yeah. And so I think with that, you know, just began my journey. I, I mean, I, I guess the... It's fair to say that after a near-death experience, the next thing facing you is how to integrate it into your life. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you do now? And for me, remember, I was told, pay attention to my relationships. So after a year, I was still able to just sit here and stare at the wall for six hours. No problem. And my wife at the time came in and said, we need to go to marriage therapy. So we did for 18 months, and it didn't really do any good. So it was good that we put an effort, but it was it, it, an interesting statistic is that, or like you might say, normal people in the United States, there's a divorce rate of about 
So that already says the odds are somewhat against you. And for people who have near-death experiences, it's more like 78%, which is a 50% increase. And this is something I speak about a lot now because I don't think there's enough information or enough support out there for people, not only who are having near-death experiences, but for the spouses who did not have the near-death experience and feel a little lost or a little left in the dust. And so it's easy to see how this can happen. I mean, like I said, 47% on a good day are able to keep it together while the 53% not. Now you throw this uh, randomizer in like a near-death experience and you're looking at this person who sounds like they did yesterday. They look like they did yesterday, but it's not the same person. Your values have changed. Everything has changed. Your shared hopes, dreams, even your shared prejudices have changed. But you've become maybe less religious, but certainly more spiritual. And that brings a certain ambiguity into the relationship of its own. And there are not too many relationships that welcome any kind of ambiguity. People generally want to know where they stand and where you stand. But that's that's part of the challenge is spirituality itself is a very ambiguous subject. We can talk about all the blacks and whites of good and evil, then we really start to learn that maybe there are no good people and no bad people. They're just overwhelmed people who are making good and bad choices. They're not their choices, but they, they may, they're capable of making mistakes and they're capable of making great decisions. But they're none of those things. They're just, it, they're just a single moment in time in terms of how we measure them. But it's not the complete picture. So anyway, like I said, that just kind of, kept rolling through my mind. So that's something I talk about a lot these days, is the impact on relationships and the self and how to, not necessarily how to navigate it, because I'm not going to be someone who stands up there and makes huge declarative statements that ends all conversation. I'm more likely to phrase it as a question, questions that just provoke thought. Because if you ask a question, people can fill it in the best they can with their own experience or their own intuition. And that's where we start. You know, just giving people the answer, they're not going to value it very much. And it's not their answer. It needs to be their answer. So I think as we focus on these sometimes somewhat ambiguous truths that resonate with us, that ring true, but we may not be fully there yet, as we keep them in mind, as we live our life from day to day, they become a filter through which we see life and, and see experience. And then we start to be able to phrase what we see and phrase what we feel in those terms. And we start to fill in those gaps. And one day we have this, we don't answer the question. We awaken to the question, have this aha moment. And we're able to now restate that truth in our own words with our own authenticity that before then may well have been counterfeit. Jim, do you mind if I ask you a few more questions about your experience? Go right ahead. Okay. Do you have some sense of? who the voice was that was speaking to you. Yeah, it certainly knew more than me. It's, it's interesting, you know, everybody, I mean, not everybody, a lot of people want to hear you say it was God, or they certainly, a lot of people want you to say it was Jesus. Like every third word in your dialogue has to be Jesus, or it wasn't from God. It's like, but I don't think it required him identifying himself as anything other than the truth. And it was truth. I mean, here's the thing. It needed to be a truth that resonated with me. It didn't need to be a truth that resonated simply because this entity said, I am God or I am Jesus. That's a horrible reason for you to say that truth resonates for you. I don't think that's what God wants. I think that's what free will is all about. And that's why it was given to us, that we see our truth and we hear our truth in as unfiltered a manner as possible. And if we choose to do the right thing, we choose to do the right thing, not because God told us to, or Jesus told us to, or Buddha or Muhammad, but because it simply felt right to do the right thing. It's like solving a complex math problem and you solve it for what is right. And solving it for what is right usually incorporates a certain amount of selflessness, not ego, not self-service, but our life in service to others. So. And I think the divine God, I do think God really enjoys us going through that sense of discovery on our own, 
Just like if we give a child a puzzle, we don't solve the puzzle for them. We watch them solve the puzzle and we delight in seeing how their mind works in solving that puzzle and putting the toy together or dressing their doll or building a tree house or whatever it is they do. We want to know them through the experience of their discovery. And I think it's the same thing here. So it could have, you know, it could have been a more evolved version of myself. But if you really get metaphysical about it, you know, we're already considered to be, or we're already one with God. You just you talk to the version you can understand and communicate with. So if you're already one with God, little does it matter whether it's an advanced version of yourself or whether it's the highest level of God. The fact is, God comes down and speaks to us on our own level. You know, the the model it used that is somewhat mechanical is suited to me because, you know, I've, I've built things. You know, I built airplanes, so obviously I understand gears and mechanisms and things like that. I think it was poetic how it was housed in an egg and then it says this is a future birthing into the now. Well, that made nice sense. I love that answer, Jim. So do you remember any of the choices that you took out? No. And I was told it wasn't important. Like I said, I remember two that I left in. One of them has come to pass. It was an odd one. It was it was very, well, I mean, it, was, it was a nice one. So it was not like it had a great moment. It was just a moment. But the other one has yet to come to pass. And that's the one with the grandchildren at the amusement park. Um, but I definitely was given a, a sense of, in, in waiting in anticipation, if you will, for future probabilities to emerge, there, there's an increased instinct in knowing which ones will and which ones won't. And so what's nice is it removes the need to do anything to make these good or, or favorable probabilities emerge. It's more just the very slight guidance, it might be a word here or a nudge there, but very little interaction is needed to sort of guide the process into expression. And then it's it's the right fit. And you're and the thing is, you're already anticipating it. So you're ready for it. At one point, the voice said to you that no one deserves salvation. Could I ask you what what was meant by salvation? What do we need salvation from? Well, I think, again, because it just referred to the chains of the world. You know, when you make bad choices, you have to cr carry the crushing weight of those chains once they're forged around you. We'll take a look out the window. How many people do you see carrying those chains? Salvation is freedom from carrying chains. Salvation ultimately is pointing in the direction of less attachment to this world. You know, this is not our true home. We're all just passing through. As an example, if you want to continue in the tradition of Christianity, you know, at one point, you know, Judas was a zealot, and the zealots had this military idea of what the coming Messiah would be. Like, they thought Jesus was going to come and be a general and throw the Romans out. And, you know, if you lived under the Romans, that'd probably be a very natural prophecy to want to believe in. And Judas said to Jesus one day, said, uh, okay, so you can, you know, like, raise the dead, heal the blind, feed the hungry. What's a little thing like kicking out the Romans? And Jesus literally said, yeah, this world's always been crap, and it's always going to be crap. I didn't come here to fix the world. I came here to fix you, including the Romans. And look what happened 352 years later with the first Nicene Conference in which the Roman Empire adopted Christianity. Oh, wow, I never thought about that. There it is. So that, that's, that speaks to the nature of the world and what salvation means. You know, you can't row in two boats at once. You have to choose. And that choice is one you make every single moment. Just like this universe, it only exists because God wills it into existence every single moment. What does it mean that right and wrong are variables outside of our control? Yeah. Okay. If most people would define, well, most people it, it sort of quickly might define right and wrong as defined by law. Right, you know, don't beat your wife, don't beat your kids, don't beat people up, at, you know, because the coffee line is too long. But I'll give you an example. Sometimes right and wrong is no more than the whimsy of a politician's pen. 
If you don't believe me, just talk to anyone who was engaged in the Underground Railroad during the Civil War, bringing slaves from the South and bringing them up to the North. They were absolutely traitorous criminals to right. the Confederacy. And yet, would we say they were wrong today? So let's just use that as our example. So that's why I say, and, and I've definitely seen God bend the rules. Yes. And it's kind of interesting to see it. And it's interesting to be in the middle of it when it's happening. But again, it's not for any reason like, oh, I got to speed and I didn't get caught because I had to get to my hot date. It's nothing stupid like that. It's just how it's just interesting how the timing can sometimes be accelerated or be delayed, or someone can be distracted, or someone can decide to be kind. It's interesting to see how reality bends and how synchronicities may even increase as a result of, I think, reharmonizing with the way we're intended to live. And to me, that's what an NDE is. It's like rebooting your computer. Yeah, I now agree with that. Now you're version 2.0. Yeah. I'm going to read a quote that I heard you say in another interview that really struck me. Sure. You said, by approaching a state where we're not collapsing our probabilities into a singular point of present reality, we are becoming the light. Mm. What does that mean? Could you explain that? To me. Yeah, what I'm speaking to there is this. We live, okay, let me start it this way. You know how one, once COVID kicked in about almost two and a half years ago, you know, this was also timed with the presidential election. This was timed with so many of the social justice issues going on, whether it was Black Lives Matter, Me Too, uh, heaven knows what else. And then, of course, you know, how are we handling migration? Everything was a rage. Everything was dialed up 11 out of 10. Everyone was screaming and no one was communicating. It was just, and it was just hitting us on social media every day. And then it really boiled down to who's vaccinated and who's not and which, which camp are you in and how's that going to get politicized? So everyone was almost by default being forced into this binary way of thinking. It's us or them. It's vaccinated or unvaccinated, rich or poor, black or white, male or female, blah, blah, blah. But it was, the word or was between the two camps. And part of living in that incredibly polarized environment that is very binary is it forces you to say something is this or it's that. And yet, between the polarities of this and that, the polarities of right and wrong or, right. or you know, male, female, rich or poor, there is a tremendous amount of shades of gray between the two. And the shades of gray are really where we find each other. They're where we start to understand compromise. Because when you're in those binary camps, it's my way or the highway, right? There's only one way and it's my way and everybody else is going to burn in hell, okay? Whereas those shades of gray have more tolerance. There's more opportunity for love. There's more opportunity for understanding. And this is, like I say, is where we actually discover each other. And this is where the truth lies. Not in the right or in the wrong, but in the in-between. Okay. So part of seeing, as I meant, you, to, you know, was referencing in quantum physics, the superposition. Superposition probabilities just means a bunch of options are stocked, stacked on top of each other at any given moment in time. You can go left or right, up or down, or choose to do something or not do something. But at each moment, you generally make a choice. But what I was saying is if you wait to the last possible minute and don't try to force anything, don't try to force a choice as much as you can, just let things unfold naturally to just be in a receptive state of waiting, then this is preferable. And so live a type of life in which you don't have to force choices. Live a type of life in which the choices that naturally unfold are good choices. because. You know, like like I've said before, you know, when when somebody does something really bad, in in you know, it's in the newspaper or in the news, a lot of people will say, you know, that's that's Satan, you know, whatever. They're blaming Satan. I'm like, Satan didn't do anything. Satan might, or the negative power, might present you with choices, 
but no one is sitting on you and putting a funnel down your mouth and put, pouring something down. That is not happening. We make those choices. It's us that we need to blame. You want to find who to blame? Look in the mirror. And so that's why I say the that art of letting go is where you live the type of life that the things that naturally tend to eventuate are good things. And then you don't have to force anything. And this is moving toward the light. Thank you so much for explaining that, Jim. And thank you for sharing your near-death experience and everything else that you've shared with us today. Is there anything else that you would like to say about your books or about where people can find you? Well, uh, the books are on Amazon. Like I said, The In Between, A Trip of a Lifetime, followed by The Practice In Between, The Art of Letting Go. And if you go, uh, I believe you mentioned it at the beginning, In Between Productions, that's with an S, dot com, uh, you'll see the narrative of my near-death experience as well as a couple of places you can click to go to Amazon for the books. I am not concerned about selling books. I'm not, believe me, nobody's doing this for the money. But it, you, might, you might find it interesting. It might resonate with you. If anyone has any questions, if they go to that website, they'll see a contact link and they can click on it and ask me anything they want. All right. I'll have all of those links in the description. Thank you so much for being willing to have this conversation with me today, Jim. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you to those who joined us today. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, share this video with your friends and comment with your thoughts and opinion. And check the description box for the links to my TikTok and Instagram where I share the more personal side of my life, my website where I share my paintings and merch, and also the Be A Guest link for anybody who's interested in sharing their story. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.